The 007 film franchise has been going on more or less since 1962 pretty consistently. Now how did it pull this off? Well, it's not because of its timelessness, that's for sure. In fact, most entries are charmingly dated, let's say. Maybe it's the armchair tourism, maybe it's the charisma of its leads, or hey, maybe it's the raw, unbridled eye candy. There's something for everybody. What many viewers and fans may struggle with, though, is how disconnected most of the movies are. There are very few recurring characters, and some of them can't seem to hold on to the same actor between movies. Plot lines don't carry through, in fact, they're rarely referenced afterward despite having world-ending stakes. Nobody says, hey, remember the time some guy tried to destroy the world and restart society underwater? Or try to destroy the world and restart society in space? or destroy the world for broadcast rights in China? That is, until Eon rebooted the whole thing with Daniel Craig, taking us from his first mission to his last in a brisk five movies. Despite being a clear reboot, many fans have still tried to tie the entire thing together using mental gymnastics to explain how this guy from 1962 and this guy from 2006 are the same dude. For example, Casino Royale and Quantum of Solace kick things off in their heads, followed by the classic series which is Dr. No through Die Another Day, and then is capped off by Skyfall through No Time to Die. But then you run into massive continuity problems with Spectre and Blofeld showing up so late, so that doesn't work. Whether the shifting and sorting makes sense or not, it shows people's appetites for continuity and for fitting everything together. Anthology films aren't crazy in vogue right now, but there's a simple solution that allows for completionists to watch every film together and acknowledges Craig's reboot. I call it storybook canon. The Bond series has a deep well of history to draw from, and many writers and directors have happily drawn from it with classic iconography like this who could resist. And the Craig films probably draw the most from that well. In fact, one could say it encapsulates most of the classic series' biggest hits, as if the classic series is a fun retelling of a man's life. Here it is. Daniel Craig's iteration of Bond is the real man. Everyone else is Madeline Swan's version of him, the one in the stories she tells her daughter. It's like Big Fish, but with the license to kill. Let's assume James filled Madeline in on his escapades while they were together. Let's start with Casino Royale, specifically Mathilde's father's favorite car. Instead of winning it in a poker game as it actually happened in real life, let's say, Madeline has given it to James by his good friend Q, who is aged up to reflect the real Q's old soul. Speaking of old souls, Madeline never met Judy Dench's M, so it's conceivable she'd begin her tales for Mathilde with an M like the one she knew, and then incorporate the other one in later stories. It's out of order, but to borrow from Big Fish... Well, it's logical if you think like your father. Madeline's stories aren't a literal retelling of James's life. They're more like tall tales that borrow from real events. James's first mission that also changed his life forever involves a high-stakes card game in a luxury casino. So it makes sense that that becomes a big part of his storybook counterpart's personality, who frequents casinos in many of his adventures. Vesper Lind, who is possibly Bond's first great love, could possibly be the inspiration for Tracy in On Her Majesty's Secret Service, who dies tragically before the couple's life together could blossom, sending James on a quest for revenge in the beginning of Diamonds Are Forever that mirrors his state of mind in the real-life Quantum of Solace, albeit toned down a lot in Diamonds. Hey, maybe that makes sense too, because Madeline would have preferred to have James get over his ex-flame super quickly in her version of the story. Speaking of Quantum of Solace, one obvious parallel to James's real life is Agent Field's demise. Bond finds her covered in black gold. Madeline could swap that out for real gold. Bond and Camille's freefall would no doubt make a great pulse-pounding bit of storytelling for Madeline, readapting it into her mid-air fight between Bond and Jaws in Moonraker. Later, Bond and Camille find themselves walking through the desert in their fancy outfits. That would make a striking beat in one of Madeline's own stories, like The Spy Who Loved Me. And sticking with The Spy Who Loved Me, Sanders' descending demise could easily have been borrowed from the real Bond's run-in with Guy Haynes' bodyguard at the opera, just with a little 
little extra levity. What a helpful chap. Looking at Quantum more broadly, it could be conceivable that Madeline would transform James's real personal revenge mission in South America into none other than the basis of her story, License to Kill. <laughs> Moving forward to Skyfall. Like I mentioned earlier, Madeline uses Mallory as the basis for Bernard Lee's M. You'd have to admit they have similar gravitas about them. Bond has a brief flirtatious entanglement with Moneypenny, which carries into Madeline's tales because, well, she must not be threatened by Moneypenny, I guess. And if you believe that Bond and Moneypenny got physical after his close shave, then maybe it makes sense that Madeline would rewrite the story to where they constantly scale the mountain but never reach the summit. Close, but no cigar, ever. Were you expecting an exploding pen? Q's exploding pen line? We don't really go in for that anymore. He might have been sarcastic, but that's too great of an idea to pass up. Speaking of gadgets, a gun that's tied to your palm print, another fun idea. And speaking of fun, reptile hopping will keep kids' attention for hours, as will secret agents who get caught by the enemy, tortured for months on end, only, you know, fictional James has to get out as opposed to Silva. And he's cooler than Silva because he threw away his cyanide capsule. Do you know what it does to you? Hydrogen cyanide? When you think about it, Madeline lifts a fair amount from the real Bond Skyfall incident and her crafting of the world is not enough. James sustains a shoulder injury, falls a great distance, MI6 blows up, everyone moves to Scotland, Bond's aim is garbage while garbage sings the title song. I'm sure Madeline mentions who sings each title song. Looping back to Silva, a former agent who felt betrayed by his country and then came back from the grave for revenge, it obviously makes a great inspiration for a story where you have a former agent who feels betrayed by his country and then comes back from the grave for revenge. It's kind of poetic for Madeline's golden eye to introduce Olivia Mansfield's M, where the villain is inspired by Silva. George Lucas would say, it rhymes. I assume Bond told her about his awesome Day of the Dead costume, or maybe even ran back to the hotel and grabbed it after his helicopter shenanigans, and she thought, hey, that makes a great scary look for a bad guy. A great looking bad guy she personally witnessed was Mr. Hinks, specifically during a brutal train fight that she would later appropriate for From Russia With Love. Blofeld, James's adoptive brother? By far the most personal and prolific of the real James's adversaries, it'd make sense for Madeline to make him storybook James's chief villain. Although apparently she's too good of a storyteller to make them related. God damn she draws a few things from Blofeld. His cat, his hospitable reception, his inhospitable torture, and his lair full of identical goons. Speaking of lairs, the mountain clinic where she and James first meet obviously makes great inspiration for Blofeld's hideout in On Her Majesty's. She must have always thought the location was a bit dramatic. In general, the events of Spectre form the structure of her stories the most. Later in their timeline, the events of No Time to Die hold the greatest personal weight for her and consequently feed the most into the very personal On Her Majesty's Secret Service, depending on who you think Tracy represents. As I said, Vesper is one candidate. Madeline, though, is another, just in a more metaphorical way. With the big fish principle in mind, it makes sense how she could turn the events of her and James's love story into On Her Majesty's. In her adaptation of her and James's tragic love story, Madeline swaps their fates, and Tracy is meant to be her, and James is the one who survives. Madeline takes his place in her fantasy as any loved one would wish in such a tragedy. She also takes the words, we have all the time in the world, which James says to her at the peak of their happiness, and turns them into a tragic refrain. There's no hurry, you see. We have all the time in the world. You yourself can pick whichever interpretation you prefer as to who Tracy is, Vesper versus Madeline. Personally, I prefer Madeline. Miss Swan's storybook world is beautiful in a way. Not only does James live on in it, he lives on forever. He always returns. He always saves the world. And he does it with a smile and a wink. Now, you may be thinking one glaring flaw in storybook canon is the rampant sexism and misogyny. How do you reconcile this? You really can't. There's no way Madeline would tell her daughter stories of her father being gross and weird and creepy. You just gotta accept the meta explanation that those movies were made 
when things were different, let's be honest. You also have to pretend she's skipping over the myriad of sex scenes. I mean, not great for kids. With that said, though, it would make sense that Madeline would fill her stories with strong, interesting female characters like Domino, Natalia, Anya, Pam, and others. So, there it is. What I think is the best way to tie the entire franchise together, no doubt it'll all fall apart once the new 007 gets going, but for now, what do you think of storybook canon? Does it stack up, or is it blasphemy to pull a it was all a dream kind of thing on Connery through Brosnan? Let me know. Obviously, you know the YouTube drill, like, subscribe, ring the bell. It helps me so much, especially starting out, um, supporting the channel supports me. I'd love to kind of just keep doing this. So like I said before, I'm thinking of handling topics maybe two videos at a time for the most part. Like my first two were on Star Wars, you know, not the last by a long shot, of course. I love that franchise, but we'll go back to that later. And the next one will probably be another James Bond video. So let me know what you'd like me to cover in whatever franchise you want and we'll probably get to it at some point. For now, thanks for stopping by and let's do it again sometime.